Hello and welcome to a lecture on discrete two-component L matching. My name is Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, I'll introduce you to the theory of discrete two-component L-type matching. We'll do an example where we use this theory to match a short monopole antenna to 50 ohms at a frequency of 30 megahertz. A very typical kind of example and uh, a realistic one, I would say. Then we'll have a brief digression and really a preview on RF transistor amplifier design. Now this seems to be unrelated to the topic of impedance matching, but it isn't. You have probably seen in the previous lecture where we talk about the fact that we are going to design amplifiers by selectively mismatching the input and output ports of the two ports representing the transistor. So we have some issues to discuss uh, concerning that idea. We'll do it very briefly. We'll discuss an important special case, reel-to-reel -reel matching using the same theory. Now, in general, this is complex to real, or vice versa. So reel-to-reel is a special case, and it turns out in the special case, out will pop a parameter, which we'll call Q, and this Q parameter has ramifications later. At the same time, we'll see a simpler way to do matching when, when both impedances are real. And to demonstrate that technique, we'll do an example where we go from 5 kilo ohms to 50 ohms at 75 megahertz, a very typical kind of impedance matching problem to do. And then finally, a summary to review these techniques. Okay, discrete two-component L-type matching. What do I mean by that? Well, in general, we're going to have a complex-valued impedance. I call it Z sub S conjugate here, the conjugate implying that we're really doing conjugate matching, but the technique works the same either way. When we do impedance matching, we are looking for either conjugate matches or reflectionless matches. Uh, so this is conjugate with respect to uh, Z sub S. It'll be reflectionless with respect to Z sub S conjugate. So that uh, may be confusing if you're not used to thinking in those terms, but you can always sort it out in the end. If you get confused, you can always check the result, make sure you did, did the right thing. Suffice to say now, everything we're going to talk about applies equally well, regardless of whether we're doing conjugate matching or reflectionless matching. In any event, we're going from complex over here to real on this side. So the notation I'm using is Z sub S for the complex part, uh, R sub L for the real part. Uh, S and L meaning source and load. Of course, these don't have to be source and load, uh, but that's just the notation I'm using. A series first L match consists of a reactance in series with the complex impedance. That's the sense in which it is series first. A parallel first L match consists of a reactance which is in parallel to the complex valued impedance. And in that sense, it's parallel first. So I should point out, this is my notation. This is my way of talking about it. Uh, some other people talk about it this way, yet other people talk about it using different terms or different notation. The point is not to try to memorize somebody's notation or somebody's way of talking about it, but to make sure you understand the underlying concept. And the underlying concept is that we have a series reactance and a parallel reactance in either case, and the question is, is which one is adjacent to which uh, of the two impedances that we're trying to match. Okay, let's do the series first case. I'm just going to give you the solution, and then I'll explain why it works. The reactance that goes in parallel here in the series first circuit is given by this expression, plus or minus. So you see right away there's two possible solutions. Square root of R sub L squared R sub S over R sub L minus R sub S. Now, uh, what, are R, what is R sub S? Uh, we're calling Z sub S here, R sub S plus J X sub S, like so. So R sub S is the real part of Z sub S. That's all there is to it. First, you get X uh, sub par, the reactance that goes in parallel with the real valued impedance. And there's two possible solutions there. To get the series reactance, this one up here, 
you simply evaluate this expression. Minus x sub s, x sub s being this thing here, minus the imaginary part of j times x sub par, you just worked out x sub par here, in parallel with r sub l. Now remember what it means to be in parallel. That means j x sub par r sub l over j x sub par plus r sub l. That's the parallel impedance that's formed by uh, those uh, two impedances. So this is much simpler to write than uh, all this, so I will typically use this notation, but this is what it means. Okay, so I'm just bringing these in from the blue. I strongly recommend that you independently derive these equations. It's not hard at all. So some notes about the solution. First uh, note, as we already have, that is R sub L is greater than R sub S. We have two possible solutions. We already said that. However, if R sub L is less than R sub S, we have a problem with the denominator here. The denominator becomes negative. And the square root of a negative number is imaginary. So this becomes baloney in this case. So when R sub L is less than R sub S, we have no solutions. What that means is a lossless match is not possible. So you should check for that. Uh, don't uh, just jump into these equations uh, with the possibility that this thing is negative and end up with a ridiculous result. All right, when R sub L is less than R sub S, there are no solutions for the series first match. Okay, now the parallel first match. In the parallel first match, this reactance is in parallel with the complex valued impedance. And here is how you get the solution. First, you solve for the parallel valued reactance. You use, do this by uh, the use of a quadratic equation. This is a quadratic equation for x sub par. There's x sub par here. Uh, here are the coefficients in this quadratic equation. Uh, r sub l minus r sub s. 2x sub s r sub l and r sub l magnitude z sub s squared. So you solve this quadratic equation, you get a number of solutions equal to the number of real valued roots of this quadratic equation. And then to get the series reactants, this one here, you change the sign of the imaginary component of the parallel combination of j x sub par in parallel with um, z sub s. That's all there is to it. Once again, I strongly recommend that you independently derive these equations. The technique for doing this is, is the same, uh, and it's just a matter of doing the math. So what you do is you move systematically from right to left or left to right. You can do it either way. You figure out what you have to do to convert one impedance into the other one. It takes about a page of math, but again, it's, a, it's very straightforward. Certainly, graduate students in this class, you should be able to do that. Okay, so let's apply uh, these equations. So in this example, we have a 30 megahertz short monopole. By the way, I should show what this looks like. Here's a ground screen. Here's a monopole antenna. That could be a, a 30 megahertz short monopole. In any event, uh, this particular monopole has a impedance, Z sub A for antenna, of 1.2 minus J 450.3 ohms. This is a very typical impedance for a small antenna to have, has a tiny real part, has a gigantic and negative uh, imaginary part, and uh, we wish to match that to 50 ohms, which is a very typical receiver input impedance, and we wish to do that at 30 megahertz, the high end of the HF band. In this case, we wish a conjugate match. Uh, that's the typical thing to do for a receive antenna. For a transmit antenna, it's probably more common to do a reflectionless match although uh, there's no hard and fast rule that says you have to do one or the, over the other. In this case, I'm just telling you, we're going to choose a conjugate match. So in terms of the notation we were using before, Z sub A is Z sub S, and uh, so all we have to do is substitute those values as uh, indicated. And we look here, we see R sub L is greater than R sub A, which is R sub S. So there will be two possible series first solutions. Also, there will be two possible parallel first solutions. So we see that there's four possible solutions to this. Two series first, 
two parallel first. Without further ado, here are the solutions. So here is x sub uh, SER, x sub par, in each of those four possible solutions. The two series first solutions here, the two parallel first solutions here. So for example, for the series first solution with the plus sign in front of the radical, we find that x sub uh, SER is uh, 4.42.6 ohms, x sub par is 7.8 ohms, and so on. And these uh, can be either positive or negative. These are going to, the positive values are going to turn out to be uh, inductances. The negative values are going to turn out to be capacitances. Now we have not yet used the fact that we know the frequency and we're going to need the frequency to get the values of those components. So here's how we do that. Uh, we recognize that the reactance of an inductor is just plus omega L. Remember omega is 2 pi F. The reactance of a capacitor is minus 1 over omega C. And we can use those relationships to convert the reactances we computed previously on the previous slide to component values. So for example, we find the series first solution with the plus sign in front of the radical gives us a series component, which is a 2.35 microhenry inductor, and a shunt or parallel component. By the way, these mean the same thing. Uh, consisting of a 41.4 nanohenry inductor. All right? And if we get a negative reactance, that turns into a capacitor and so on. So now we have the components for each of these uh, solutions. Here I'm showing you all four solutions uh, in the form of schematic diagrams uh, for the component values that you get at 30 megahertz. At 30 megahertz. So for example we get one solution, one series first solution consisting of two inductors. We get another series first solution consisting of an inductor in series and a capacitor in parallel. We see yet uh, another solution consisting of a parallel first uh, inductor and a series inductor, and yet another solution consisting of a parallel inductor and a series capacitor. So the question will be, which one of these four things do we choose? Well, actually, prior to that, the question is, how can we evaluate whether these are right or not? This kind of work becomes sufficiently complicated not really difficult, but just complicated enough that it's very easy for even the best to make a mistake. These are exercises I strongly recommend. First, you can confirm these results are the correct ones using just traditional sophomore level circuit theory. So for example, I have Z sub A over here. I have R sub L over here. You know what I can do is figure out, well, what's this impedance looking this way? That's the parallel combination of this inductor and this resistance. And then I can figure out what I see looking this way. And to do that, I just add the impedance of that inductor. And that had better be ZA conjugate looking that way, right? Because that's what it takes to have a conjugate match. If I don't see ZA conjugate looking that way, then there's a problem. Right? I can do the same thing for each, each one of these. 50 ohms in series with a 1.83 picofarad capacitor. That gives me some impedance. Then the impedance looking this way is just given by a parallel combination of those two things. And that had better be equal to Z sub A conjugate and so on. So these things are very easy to check and you should always do that. Now another way to kind of learn about this and to tie it back into theory that we've talked about already is to treat each one of these components as a two port and then compute the S parameters for the cascade and then calculate the TPG. Why? Because if you do that right, the TPG should be one. Right? So one way to check this is to verify that the TPG is one using the S parameter approach. So for example, you know how to compute the S parameters for a parallel impedance. And you know how to compute the S parameters for a series impedance. And then I may or may not have discussed how to compute the S parameters for that cascade of those two things. If I didn't do it in a lecture, it's certainly in the textbook.
in any event, once you get that, then you have S parameters for the whole circuit. And from that, you can compute the TPG, and you can see if the TPG is 1. And that will also reinforce your understanding of that theory. By the way, for these things, I strongly recommend uh, writing MATLAB scripts, or uh, you can use the open source free alternative uh, Octave, which is what I use. And those resulting scripts will come in handy later. This is, these are things that we do over and over and over again. If you have chunks of code already written up to do these kinds of analyses, uh, all you have to do is pull them up and modify a couple values in one line, and uh, you can quickly recompute uh, the results. Okay, now the question of which one of these four solutions to choose. Well, here are some considerations. First, reactances must be within a reasonable range. That is, we have to have values for these components which are reasonable. They're implementable. They're things we can buy. Capacitances, probably not less than one picofarad or so. Once you start talking about capacitances less than a picofarad, it becomes very, very difficult to control those values. The stray capacitances that you have in circuits are typically on the order of a picofarad. So trying to design precisely using components that have to have picofarad or less capacitance just is very, very difficult to do. Not impossible, but it gets really difficult. For inductances, typically greater than 10 microhenries uh, for RF applications is, is hard to control. The problem is that inductances are typically implemented as coils. And in between each turn of the coil, there is some capacitance. The turn-to-turn -turn spacing kind of looks like a parallel plate capacitor in some sense. So you have a little bit of capacitance there. So at a high enough frequency, an inductor looks like an inductor in parallel with a capacitor. And that's a very different thing from an inductor. So uh, there is no hard and fast rule here. But certainly once you get above 10 microhenries or so, you are in the regime of inductances that become very difficult to control in RF circuits. Now these are very rough rules of thumb, so there's no uh, hard and fast rules here that you can't go below 1 picofarad or above 10 microhenries, and in fact you can depending on the frequency. So these are just intended to give you some rough ideas of what reasonable numbers are. Second consideration, obviously it's convenient if reactances are close to standard values, that is if capacitors have uh, values that are standard for capacitors and inductances have values which are close to standard for inductors. What tends to happen is if you have to try to reach non-standard values using standard value capacitors and inductors, you end up doing things like this where you have things in parallel or you have inductors in series and that takes up more space on the circuit board. It creates all kinds of problems related to electromagnetic compatibility, you're consuming valuable board space, and so on. So it's convenient if uh, reactances are close to standard values. Third consideration, AC coupling versus DC coupling. Frequently, we can choose a matching circuit that gives us a free DC block. What do I mean by that? A capacitor in series is a DC block. It blocks DC. All the time in RF circuits, we have issues with stray or undesired DC ending up in a circuit. And if we can arrange for a series capacitor, that's a free a DC block, and that can be useful. So sometimes we look for a matching circuit, which gives us that for free. And there are other ways in which DC blocks can, can appear or be manipulated into these circuits. Beware of creating a low impedance path to ground for DC power supply current. Now, this is going to be a huge issue for amplifier design. The classic mistake is you have RF plus DC on some path. So here's a path, and here's some terminals. And you decide to put a inductor in parallel with that uh, circuit. So maybe this is your matching circuit. You ended up with a matching circuit that has a... Uh, parallel inductance. Well, guess what the DC wants to do? The DC wants to run this way and get shorted out. So these are things you have to be aware of when you actually implement these matching circuits. And that may dictate your choice of which circuit you choose. So summarizing, these are four things that you can take into account which will 
result in a down selection typically from all the possible L-type matching circuits you can synthesize to maybe one or two that you uh, actually might select. In the 30 megahertz monopole example we just did, here I'm showing you the component values again and just walking you through what we might choose in the context of the considerations I just showed you. So for example, component values, well, 15.4 microhenries at 30 megahertz is pretty high. Uh, you can do it, but I would prefer not to. Similarly, 1.83 picofarads at 30 megahertz is getting pretty low. You can do it, but why go there if you don't have to? So I don't, I don't like either one of those solutions. In the series first solutions, uh, all the component values I'd say look kind of reasonable. Uh, we could look now at which ones are closer to standard values. Uh, I'm not going to do that just uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, uh, but you might. Uh, what I do note here is that we have a shunt reactance, which in one case is an inductor, and in another case is a capacitor. And if I were to choose this shunt inductance, and I had any DC on that side of the circuit, this would give me the problem I just identified in the previous slide. That is, I would be creating a short circuit. By selecting this circuit, which I'm now showing here, I prevent any DC over here from being shorted out by the matching circuit. So I don't know in this particular example if there would be DC or there or not. I will tell you that's very common to see DC at the input of a receiver for whatever reason. Uh, my temptation would be to probably choose this particular solution. Now there's one other consideration that I didn't show you in the previous slide, and that's bandwidth, and in particular, frequency response. In other words, is this high pass or low pass? So we, we're going to want to consider those things. I'll come back to that in a moment. A brief digression on transistor biasing. I probably explained in a previous lecture that our scheme is going to be to put the active device in the context of a two port, connect an input matching network to the input, connect an output matching to the net, network to the uh, output. And these could very well be L matches. So we already are developing circuitry that would go in these uh, boxes. A big part of settling on design for these impedance matching networks, the IMN and the OMN, is going to be to figure out how to accommodate DC biasing. Let me show you how that plays out. So typically, and here I'm assuming a BJT uh, a transistor in a common emitter configuration, that means the emitter is tied to ground, uh, the way I might bias that is to have the power supply up here, some resistor which is setting the collector current, I sub C, and then to keep RF from running up into the power supply, I might put an inductor in there. RFC, by the way, stands for RF choke. Choke is kind of an archaic term for an inductor, but you see it all the time in schematics. So a typical way to bias a transistor in an RF amplifier is to again use our bias to set the uh, collector current, block the RF from the power supply using a, an inductor, and then you have the problem of keeping the DC out of the impedance matching networks. So for that you might put capacitors on either side uh, on the input and the output because those capacitors would be DC blocks that would keep the DC supply from running this way or running this way, which would probably be undesired. Now, if you select the correct or the best possible matching networks, these capacitors might already be present as part of the impedance matching network, and you might not need to add these. So keep this in mind when we start designing transistor amplifiers. You're going to be tempted to throw these in all the time, whether you need them or not, because you know that you have to isolate DC. But if you properly design the input-output matching networks, you are commonly able to put a capacitor in a place where it can serve that role. 
So a skilled RF designer is always looking for ways to save components or to simplify the circuitry by taking advantage of those, uh, those ideas.